What is the purpose of a university? In fact, I'm going to ask one other question for you to think about. What is the purpose of a university degree? <laughs> now, I've been working in the higher education industry for over 20 years now. And over that 20 years, I've seen massive change. And those changes that we're witnessing are really complex. There are so many parties, groups involved in this industry that we call higher education. There are governments that provide the funding and uh, the policy that drives what happens in universities. There's university management. There's industry. There's teachers and academics. There's uh, students. And I think the students are really a very important part of the equation here that we need to, to really have a close look at. Because the way in which students treat their university education, the way they perceive the importance of a university degree, I think is a measure of how healthy the higher education system is. So I'd like to share with you a little example. A little example of a communication I recently had with one of my potential students. I teach into a business course, I teach a marketing subject. And I recently received an email from a student that went along the lines of this. And I've copy and pasted word for word exactly how the email exchange took place here. Hi, can you give me some insight and details about this subject? <laughs> I'm taking a banking and finance major and wonder if I'm suitable to take this as one of my electives. Is it a difficult subject? <laughs> so I replied, hi, it will be difficult, but that's what makes it a good unit to study. You'll get a lot of practical knowledge but you'll have to work hard throughout semester. A lot of people choose it simply because it doesn't have an exam. <laughs> but that's, that's not a good reason, because it's a lot of work. Why are you considering it? And the reply came back. Thanks for the advice. Yeah, I'm looking for another elective and I'm interested in marketing electives. Can you recommend me which marketing electives that is available this semester? I'm just looking for a not difficult elective. Fabs. <laughs> Small typo, B's next to N on the keyboard. So my response, why do you want one that's not difficult? Surely relevance to your future career would be a better criteria? And the response absolutely floored me. I don't need a subject that's relevant to my future career as I'm going to continue my father's business, <laughs> which has no relevance in my studies. This is a business course, it's father's business. So you're all sitting there asking the question that I had to ask, which I did, so why are you studying? <laughs> and the response was, just to have a degree, sir. Thank you. I couldn't resist. My final reply that I sent to this student, if it's just for a degree, then I can't help you. I want my students to be motivated to learn rather than just looking for shortcuts. Please do not enrol in my unit. <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> I hope you find a really easy unit somewhere else, even if it's completely irrelevant to you. <laughs> good luck. And he did, and he was polite, he sent a reply back. Okay, sir, thank you for your time, have a good day. Word for word, that is how the communication progressed. Now, I've got to ask the question, what is this student thinking? Why are they studying? What's their focus? This is an example, and it's just one example, it's the tip of the iceberg, and I'm seeing this as a trend more and more, that students are studying not to learn, but to gain a qualification. They see themselves as consumers buying a degree. When in fact what they should be doing is studying to learn, be passionate about learning and understanding the world in which they live. And the qualification will then come out of that. So this big shift is happening. The shift where students see themselves as being involved in a transaction, paying money to receive a degree, as opposed to building a lifelong relationship and passion for learning. We're seeing this big shift along this continuum now, I know what you might be thinking. You might be sitting there right now thinking, that's not like me. I'm not like that student. 
Or when I was a student, I wasn't like that. Okay, well, look, I, I see cracks appearing in the system beyond just this one email exchange. You can read any news article on a regular basis. We're seeing news regularly being pumped out. Articles such as this, we're seeing dropout rates from university courses getting higher and higher every year. And even those students that stay enrolled and complete their degrees, they're becoming less engaged with the learning process. I'm seeing in the, the 20 plus years that I've been teaching, attendance in classes is plummeting, dropping further and further all the time. And the most frightening story that we're often seeing in the media, stories such as this, where students, the main thing they perceive they're getting out of a degree is a massive hex debt, okay, with very few employment opportunities. Now, these are all perceptions, perceptions that the media, sure, is fueling, but I see it as all part of the trend, this trend towards perceiving education as a, a commodity that we buy, rather than something that we buy into for our lives. Now, it's not all bad news. There are some things that universities actually do really, really well. Universities, ultimately, are about generating and disseminating knowledge. They conduct research. And that research feeds into industry. And industries thrive from a lot of the information that comes out of universities and the research that universities are producing. And the other thing that universities do well is this process of credentialing, confirming to industry that the graduates that come out of university courses have the skills, the knowledge, and the ability to perform as a, a member of the industry or society or the world in which we live. And that world is changing. It's changing very, very rapidly. But still, we see this thing happening here with, with people moving along this continuum from where I believe they should be at learning across to just wanting a qualification. So what's changed? Now you can spend days, weeks, months of your life looking at TED Talks, talking about how society is changing and how we need to recognise that change is happening all around us. But higher education, universities, have been around for hundreds of years. And universities haven't changed a lot. Over those hundreds of years, there are artefacts that exist in higher education that really haven't changed, that probably need to. Things such as lectures. A bit ironic that I'm giving a lecture right now. <laughs> <laughs> Things such as degrees, a three-year degree that people study when they turn 18 and for three or four years, and, and then they go off and, and build a career. Things such as timetables that are inflexible. Things such as long-form content. And when I say long-form, it might be a three-year degree a three-month semester, a three-hour lecture. They are all long-form compared to the way we as consumers receive content these days. So what we're seeing is this old, archaic system that doesn't match the needs of today's student, today's industry, today's society. And I think higher education can learn a thing or two from other industries. Other industries that have faced obsolescence as a result of the change happening in society, or the changes happening in society. So let me share a little story with you, unrelated to higher education, but there will be a link you'll see a little later. I'm going to take you back in time to when I was a teenager. And that's a long time ago now. <laughs> I'm going to take you back to the 1970s, in fact, the late 1970s. And like most teenagers, I loved music. Listen to a lot of commercial radio, the top 40 songs and so on, and there was a, an up-and-coming band back in the late 1970s that I, I really liked listening to on commercial radio. You may have heard of them. They're called Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. and back in the late 70s, they were in the album, uh, in the studio, recording a new double album. That double album was called Tusk. Some of you may know of Tusk. But it was the title track from this double album that was getting all the play on the radio. And I loved it. It was unique. It had a, a really cool drum beat, and I thought, wow, that music is great. So what I did was start earn, saving up my pocket money. I thought, I'm going to go and buy that album. So $15 later, I went down to Brash's, I think it was, where I bought my vinyl records back in those days. $15 was a lot of money for a teenager. And there I was. I bought the vinyl album, riding my bike back home with it, and thought, well, I'm going to lie on the living room floor and listen to this 
new record. And you know what? I was really disappointed. I actually felt ripped off. And you know why? Because 19 of those 20 tracks were awful. I didn't like them. I spent $15 buying this double album just for one track. I felt deceived by a system that made me buy a bundle when all I wanted was just one small part of that bundle. I've got to say, those other 19 tracks, today I actually like listening to them. Hey, but back then I didn't. Let's fast forward in time, 20 years. Let's not jump 40 years ahead yet. Let's jump forward 20 years, 1999. You may be familiar with a product that was launched in 1999. I'm calling it a product. It was called Napster. Do I remember Napster? Some of you may. Napster was a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network that specialised in one particular type of file, MP3s. Music. Napster was all about illegal sharing of music. <laughs> and the music industry looked at this and said, oh my God, we've got a problem here. Now the problem obviously was they could see their revenues drying up. Suddenly they were going to not make any money because people would be sharing and music amongst each other and not paying for it anymore. But why did people want to do that? It wasn't only because it was free. It was because it was unbundled, it was convenient, and it was available to people when and where they wanted it. Now, the music industry fought back the only way they knew how to. They fought back by wheeling in their lawyers, big artists like Metallica, Madonna. They employed their, uh, their lawyers to, to shut down Napster, and that happened. Napster shut down after a couple of years. However, let's fast forward another couple of decades to today. And as you're aware today, the music industry is thriving. It's thriving because of services such as Spotify, Google Play, Apple Music. And so we've come through, this industry has come through these problems and reached a point where it is now thriving. And we're consuming more music than ever before and we're paying for it through services such as this. At least many of us are, and an increasing number of us are. So it's a completely transformed industry that's been transformed through a process of unbundling, satisfying customers' needs on demand and doing it in a convenient way. So back to education. What can education learn from what's happened in the music industry? I think we can learn a lot. Each of these three things here. Think about education. Maybe we need to unbundle education. Rather than saying, as an 18-year-old, you study for three or four years, then you go and get a career. Maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. On demand. Think of when you have a need for skills and knowledge throughout your life. It's not just in your early 20s. It's right through your career. And think about how you want to learn. You want to do it in ways that's going to fit with your lifestyle. Now, a classic example of this, I teach into a business course and as part of all business courses around the world, we teach a thing called management. Now, many graduates aren't going to be working in management roles until maybe five, ten or more years after they graduate. Wouldn't it be nice if we could unravel this complicated bundle which fits into three years and stretch it across someone's lifetime? So by forming a long-term relationship with a network of universities and others, industry and so on, they can dip in and out of their education as their career progresses. Because as you're aware, many of the jobs that we are all going to be working in in the next five or ten years, some don't even exist today. So by unbundling the content, making it available on demand in convenient format, this is large-scale change. It's not going to be easy to fix. So who should drive this change? Who should be responsible for making the change? Oh, I don't have the answers here. At least I don't have all of them. But I do believe, together, all of us, when I say all of us, I mean governments. Governments that can set policy and decide how to fund higher education. They have to start thinking longer term about the needs of society, students and industry. There's employers. Employers, they're the, the ultimate beneficiaries of the higher education system. 
they should start demanding more from universities. And universities themselves, university management, should have the guts to say the way we're doing it isn't right. How can we unbundle this package that we're currently offering to make it more suitable, not only to students but to industry, academic staff and everyone that's part of the system? Academic staff, the teachers, need to stop and think about how they can engage their students in better ways that meet the students' needs. And most importantly, students. Students are incredibly powerful in this process. As students, you are customers that have a very loud voice. And you guys need to start speaking up. If you see something that's not right, you're part of the solution and demanding change. So together, whether you're a student, whether you're an academic member of staff, whether you're university management, an employer out in industry or government, it's time to start thinking about change. Thank you.